Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be doing our weekly MMA uh, contrarian betting breakdown for this weekend's card. I say weekly, even though uh, we've had a four-week hiatus, uh, and we're happy to pick it right back up here. Uh, for those of you that recall, last time we did this, we got very fortunate in that our contrarian plays, we had, I think, four or five right in a row on the same card. One of them with a 16 to 1, another with a 10 to 1. was really crazy. But it's important to realize that we're, we don't want to be results oriented about what we're trying to do with this video. And I know that you know, it's not your standard kind of way to approach betting videos and things like that. But um, I don't want you to take this video as, as, well, as what to do on this week's card. Okay. Yes, I am actually betting these things. And I'm not going to tell you not to bet what I'm betting. But this is more of a kind of a, an ongoing tutorial on how to be contrarian in general and, and how to be thinking about markets in an intelligent way. I mean, for those of you that, that may or may not know, I mean, I, I hedge fund manager. I've been analyzing stocks and stock market stuff for over 25 years, if, if not more. Um, and the approach that I use to um, be contrarian and analyze stock markets and stocks is very similar to the methods I use to analyze, say, sports betting markets or horse race betting markets or not so much horse race betting, but um, and yeah, MMA betting markets and things like that. Whenever you have a, uh, a market with a VIG of any kind, you know, you have to be better than the market, right? If, if you're giving up a dollar ten or a dollar five or in some MMA case, like two dollars, whatever it is, um, you've got to be better. And when you have a very liquid, efficient market with a lot of money being piled into it, it requires a real huge jump in your ego to presume that you can beat the market just by out analyzing everybody. OK, um, to 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 presume, say, that an NFL line is is they shouldn't be three and a half. They're so much better. That's not a leap of, of, of intelligence that I'm willing to make on myself, you know, to say, boy, Microsoft is 71. Eh, it should be 80. Ooh, I don't know, man. You've got billions of dollars being piled into this thing, you know, making this stock be 71. To just say that you think it should be more without a really good reason is, is very, very difficult. And likewise, it, when you're betting MMA, you know, to just say that, boy, oh, boy, this is minus 200. It should be more. That's that's a, a, a leap of faith I'm not willing to make. However, what you can do is get get a good gauge of public sentiment, okay, and, and get a good gauge of what part of a stock price, what part of a football line, what part of an MMA line is driven more by groupthink and narrative than anything else, okay? And, and one thing that I have determined specifically for the MMA betting market is that there, I don't say there's no others because I don't know all the other betting markets, but I have not seen a market quite like the MMA market where groupthink just takes over in an incredibly powerful way based on narrative, based on what they think that they've seen. And not only in some cases, you know, rely, uh, coagulates onto one particular play, but with respect to, to props, the betting market and groupthink carries into, the, you know, coagulates into this binary outcome. In other words, they, they have officially agree that either A wins like this or B wins like that. Okay. There might be some, you know, trinary or whatever it is. Um, but for the most part, that's what people come up with. And props being, and, and methods of victory and things like that being such a big part of MMA wagering, I mean, allow me to suggest that the, the method of victory that seems the most obvious and that is agreed upon by the public in such a strong way is almost by definition the worst value play you can make, okay? Um, and what you need to do is identify which where the public is and then fade it. Basically, the idea and the thesis is if there's one extraordinarily obvious result that everybody is playing, then basically any other wager is probably going to be good value. That doesn't mean they're all going to be good bets, but because they have to at least conform to some degree of, of, of reasonableness, you know, you know, um, 
but um uh but uh that's the way you analyze these things and that's why i don't do these betting breakdowns until later on in the week because it allows you to really get a sense for what the people are, are on um, now this one is particularly strong because we've had three weeks you know we had a three-week hiatus so people have been analyzing and overanalyzing these things to the death for a long time now and um uh, we're going to be able to come up with some stuff now again we're not going to be, we're never going to give you the most likely results. Okay. Because the most likely result is the one that everybody agrees is going to happen. And that's almost always overvalued. Okay. Um, so let's go over the rules. First of all, um, we are going to be betting one thing on every fight on this card. And uh, it's not the greatest money management system in the world, but we don't care. We are also going to be betting one unit on every fight on this card. And uh, for us, and that's not the best money management system in the world either. And for me, one unit happens to be one hundred eighty dollars, ten times high. Lucky, let's go. The other thing that we're going to do is that um, we like to have some fun with this. And because we're contrarian, we're going to presume that every bet that we make in the, uh, is going to lose. So for the main event, we are going to make sure that we bet something that rates to get all of our money back if we lose everything else. So. In a 12 fight card, uh, we are going to presume that we lose our first 11. And uh, as a result, something in the main event, we are have to, you know, we're going to need to have at least uh, 11 to 1. Okay. Um, and we are going to bet everything here, uh, either live or just as we get off, because sometimes DraftKings doesn't like Zoom. So let's just kind of get into it. And, you know, hopefully you'll appreciate the uh, the analysis. And again, uh, even though we just we, we just killed it in the last one, don't, you know, listen, past performance is no guarantee of future results. All we're trying to do is, is teach you guys how to think and teach you guys what makes sense and, and as far as being contrarian goes. We are betting everything here, but I think that if you if you think about the thought process, I think that it's going to help you even more than the actual picks. Anyway, let's just get started. Joshua Van versus Philip Brunez. And you have a case where uh, Brunez is, you know, 34 years old and you know, he was, he was preparing for a fight and Joshua Van kind of came in on short notice, but he's 22 and he's coming off some really, really impressive wins. I and mean, he had a um, uh, win over Zuma Gulov. Then he had a fight against Borges in his last fight. And for a 22 year old kid, you know, the, the narrative is that, listen, they're, they're making sure this guy wins. They wouldn't give Bunez, you know, uh, they, yes, they wanted to give Bunez his fight, but they're not going to bring Van in unless, you know, he's going to win because they don't want to ruin his momentum or something like that. Um, so that's pretty much the narrative out there. And the other thing is that even though uh, Bunez might have some takedown upside, Joshua Van has good takedown defense and he's going to be you know, stocky and this, that, and the other thing. Joshua Van is going to probably put on a lot of volume. Uh, so what that means is that the most accepted uh, narrative here is that Joshua Van is just going to win. OK, he's just going to win and he's going to win most likely by decision or maybe, maybe late. OK, so what that means is that these are things we can't bet. We can't really can't bet Joshua Van. We really can't bet him by decision. OK, so all we can really do is play Joshua Van early or Philip Bunez in the money line. So uh, let's take a look and see what these lot, what these odds are. Let's see Joshua Van round one, because that's what I'd be interested in. So Joshua Van uh, round one would be, uh, let's see, it would be round props, right? Van round one would be plus 275. Or Bunez, by decision, would be, let's see, popular. So Bunez, by decision, would be plus 215. So we're, we're going to take uh, Joshua Van uh, in round one, specifically in round one for uh, for 180. Now, this also makes a lot of sense because Van in his last fight got off to a really, really slow start and he was very low volume and he actually got knocked down. Um, and people are a little concerned about that. So listen, for my money, that's good enough for me. I think the people are going to be off the Joshua Van round one, which means that it's probably some decent value. So uh, Joshua Van round one for one. Um, next, let's go on to Nicholas Mota versus Tom Nolan. 
So we have uh, Nicholas Mota versus Tom Nolan. Uh, Tom Nolan is coming in from the contender series. He's a big minus 300 against Nicholas Mota. And Nicholas Mota has given everybody really, really sour taste in their mouth. In his last fight, he was favored over um, Trey Ogden. And boy, oh boy, did he get wrecked. Okay. He was losing. To, he was getting pieced up by the jab. He was getting taken down. And he was basically submitted. But the uh, the the judges felt that the stoppage was too uh, too quick, so they declared it a no contest. And people are really mad about that. And and uh, you know all we're getting is that Moda is just completely terrible. Um, also, it's on the last um, it's the last fight of his contract. Okay, um, and essentially Nolan is just going to just get him out of there in the first round. And that'll be the end of it. So th these are the things we can't bet. We can't, we certainly can't bet Nolan. And we can't bet Nolan in the first round. The other thing that I'm hearing, by the way, is that if Moda does win, it's going to be by uh, KO. So you also can't bet specifically Moda by KO. So what you're really left with here is you could either play Nolan late or by decision, or you could play Moda uh either late or by decision. You know, the other thing you could do, by the way, you could play Moda just the money line, okay? Um, because I don't think that's particularly overvalued. The Moda by KO is just like too easy. People are saying, oh, if he's going to win, it's definitely going to be by KO. So you could play Moda money line or you could play Nolan late. So let's take a look and see what these lines uh, would be. Moda, uh, Moda, first of all, Moda by decision plus 1,400. That's a little tough, but Nolan by decision plus 1,200. Yikes. I mean, this dude can't last a freaking, he can't run around for 15 minutes, really? Oh, goodness. I'm going to have to do this, aren't I? Well, because Nola, I mean, can't play Bet Mota. So, like plus two. All right. No one by decision, plus 1,200. Nobody's doing that, right? No, Nobody in their right mind is doing that, at least. All right, um, Weston Wilson versus Gene Silva. All right, so Weston Wilson, not really uh, uh, UFC material. Gene Silva, not he's not being viewed as particularly good, except for the fact that West Weston Wilson is terrible. I really don't like that, <laughs> that method of, uh, of analysis, by the way. So uh, he also is, is really predicted to not get Wilson out of there really early. So I think this is a similar situation to the the, um, the Nolan fight. You could either go ahead and play Weston Wilson, who I, I don't think anybody is playing, by the way, at plus 625. Um, or you could play Silva late. So let's just take a look at this. Um, Wilson, oh, my God, plus 625. That's pretty rough. Let's just see. Let's see Silva late, maybe. So Silva by decision, is plus 1,100. What's more likely, Silva winning specifically by decision or Wilson just winning? I, I, I don't know. I mean, he, just Silva's just like some big freaking block finisher? I, I, I don't know about any of this. This doesn't make any sense to me. So we'll go ahead. We'll we'll do it. We'll play Silva by decision. We'll see what happens. All right. Uh, moving on, we have uh, Fareed Basharad versus Taylor Lapalus. So this one has been kind of analyzed to death here a little bit, and and the idea is that um, is that Lapalus is probably considered sort of live because Basharat, you know, if he goes for takedowns. Uh, that's going to be his path to victory. But from what I've heard, Taylor Lapalus has some pretty good uh, takedown defense and that Lapalus is probably pretty good on the feet. Okay. So I think in both cases, the, the idea is that this fight probably goes to a decision. So these are the types of variations we really can't play. Like we can't play Basharat by decision. That's way, way too obvious. And you really can't play lapless by decision either. So it's got to be somebody finishing here. And um, I guess the most likely one is, is Basharat to finish. So let's take a look at some of these 
some of these lines here. Basharat by submission is by plus 400. I mean, that's not bad. That is not bad at all. So we're, we're going to do this. Basharat by submission plus 400. All right. Um, moving on, we have Marcus McGee versus Gaston Volanos. So uh, Marcus McGee puts on a really good pace. He is uh, uh, came in on short notice against uh, who is it? Uh, Journey Newsom took care of him. Got a first round KO against JP Buys. Took care of him. And the problem with Gaston Volanos is he just has terrible, terrible takedown defense. So all Marcus McGee has to do is either go for takedowns um, or even if not, uh, he's going to be, uh, he's going to just outpace him. I really haven't seen the case for Bolanos being made at all. So we're going to take a shot at that. Um, so it's going to be Bolanos plus the 190 for 180. All right. Matthew Semmelsberger versus Preston Parsons. So Preston Parsons is the all pressure fighter. Okay. Um, he's going to be going for takedowns and he's going to be putting a pace on Matthew Semmelsberger has had, you know, has had some shots in the last couple of weeks, uh, his fights. He actually knocked down Udis, Udis Manich, but he couldn't put him away. He had, he was doing pretty well against Jeremiah Wells, but he just kind of ran out and he's taken a lot of damage. And this is apparently a really, really bad matchup. Or pressed for for Matthew Semmelsberger. Preston Parsons is just basically one of the most popular underdogs on the week. And uh, here's another kind of uh, here's a weird observation, but it's true. Every single UFC card, people that are wagering just presume that there has to be some underdog that's that's going to win. Okay, what they do is they say, "Boy, I don't like any under other underdogs. I may as well take this one." Well, who says you have to take any underdogs? You know, and that's not a reason to make someone a better play than he otherwise would be, you know, just because, well, they're 12 fights. One of the underdogs is going to win. I mean, they probably will, but that doesn't give you justification for playing someone just because that you don't like any other underdog. And Preston Parsons, I feel, is this is that guy from this week. Um, so we're, we can't be on the Preston Parsons side. We got to pick something with Matthew Semmelsberger. Um, we can either just play him to win. Or try to figure out how he's going to win. Uh, unfortunately, there's no real consensus for um, how he's going to win. So we can't. There's nothing really for us to fade. So we're just going to take the minus 115 uh, for minus for Matthew Semmelsberger. Now again, remember, just because we're not being an underdog doesn't mean we're not being contrarian. Okay. So now we're getting this. We can't locate this. So we'll we'll, we'll save these. Okay? We'll save these. For and then we'll get this in uh, in a minute. That placement available. All right, that's, that's fair enough. Let's go back to MMA. Let's see. All right. So let's then go on to uh, um, um, Andre Arlovsky versus Waldo Cortez Acosta. So Cortez Acosta is younger. He's the, he's the better hitter. Andre Arlovsky is 44 years old. But I don't know what it is that that people are somehow giving Orlovsky a chance here. Um, I, I I don't know. Uh, I've heard some people try to play him by decision. They don't believe that Acosta can get this done. That that Orlovsky's got I don't know veteran savvy. I don't know. I'm just in, in a weird way, like the fade is to just play Acosta and knock his block off in the first round. So that's that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna play Acosta round one. I mean, you know what we could do? And we could like play him by submission or something like that instead of by KO. But that's a little too fancy for us. We're just going to play a custom round one plus 165. All right, uh, moving on. We have uh, mm, Phil Hawes versus Bruno Ferreira. So Phil Hawes has no chin. When everybody ever knocks him, you know, hits him in the face, he gets knocked out. And yet, on the other hand, Bruno Ferreira, he's not particularly durable either. And what Hawes is going for him is he's got the rest. Okay. 
So here's what's been agreed upon. This is either going to be a complete banger and someone's getting knocked out in the first round, or the only other way this fight makes its decision is if Phil Hawes goes to the wrestling. Okay? So here's really what you can play. You can play Hawes by submission, right? Because what that does is it takes a reasonable path, but plays it in a way that not many people are playing. Or if you really want, you could be really nasty and play Ferreira by decision. I, I don't know a soul that's doing that. So let's let's take a look at these various prices here. Um, okay, so first of all, pause by submission is plus 900. I mean, oh my God, Ferreira by decision is plus 1,400. Yikes. Um... So how, how, what does that look like? That that where Hawes gets takedowns maybe, but then Ferreira just does enough striking to. No, we're, we'll we'll do we'll do Hawes by submission, plus nine hundred. Hawes by decision plus a thousand. I've I've actually heard that case made so. We're going to play <coughs> pause by submission plus uh, 900 for 180. All right, uh, moving on, we have um, just a few more, I think. No, actually, we have uh, four more. Ricky Simone versus Mario Batista. This is going to be really brutal, but Ricky Simone has the, the big wrestling edge. Uh, Mario Batista has fought nobody. And while he's you know been doing really, really well, this is a, not a good matchup for him. Ricky Simone's just going to pick him up, take him down, pick him up, take him down. And Mario Batista, you know, this is where his run ends. So if that's the case, we're going to lose. We'll take Batista plus 154. Um, now what you could do, wow. Can I do this? Hang on. How about we play Batista by submission. I mean, if there's a scramble, boy, oh boy, we're really going going ballistic in this in this card, aren't we? Yeah, we're gonna do it. Batista by submission plus the one eighty. All right, moving on. We're really gonna lose everything this this card, aren't we? Well, you know, we thought that last time. Uh, all right, Jim Miller versus Gabriel Benitez. So Jim Miller. Uh, he has the most finishes of anybody in the UFC, and it's basically almost a fixed fight because, he, you know, they already said that he's going to – they want him to fight UFC 300. So uh, they're probably going to give him somebody that he can beat, and yet somehow it's like only a pick -em. So I don't know what that's all about, but Benitez is obviously going to be the side here. I don't know, you know, how – I, there's no real lean on how Benitez would win. So we're just going to take Benitez plus the 124 in the fixed fight against him. Then we have two more fights. We have, all right, this, this is one that I, I just can't resist. Mateus Nicolau versus Manel Kopp. So they fought this fight before. Uh, a couple of years ago. And I think Manel Kopp was a small favorite. And Manel Kopp put up very low volume. And Nikolau won a split decision. And all I'm hearing is that Manel Kopp is a different fighter. Man. He's now very aggressive. He's not going to let Nikolau off the hook. And you know what else about poor Nikolau? He just got knocked out in the first round. So with the new Manel Kopp, and the all of a sudden shinny Mateus Nicolau, Manel Kopp is going to get his revenge, and that'll be the end of it. So, of course, we will take Nicolau plus the 230 for 180 lost dollars. Okay, so let's now review the just atrocious bets that we made. Um, actually, we can't see them anymore because some of these are, are gone, but we'll, re we'll remember. 
So let's go back to the beginning. So Van versus Bunez. Uh, Van, you know, very low volume in his last fight. So uh, to, to bet him to finish in the first round is kind of stupid. But we did it anyway. Uh, Tom Nolan versus Nicholas Mota. Uh, you know, M Mota is, is kill or be killed. No one's going to take him out of there. But if he makes the decision, somehow uh, we're going to get it done. At, what, what was that? Plus 1,100. Same thing with Gene Silva. We got him. I don't know how Weston Wilson's going to survive, but uh, if he does, we're plus 1,100 there, all by ourselves. Breed Basharat versus Taylor Lapalus. So we we took Basharat actually to finish the big square size to play by decision. So we put him by submission, plus 400. Marcus McGee has really all the paths to victory he wants. He's got the bigger pace. He's got better striking. And he's got you know a huge wrestling advantage if he takes advantage of it. So we're going to take Bolanis. Why not? Uh, Matthew Semmelsberger against Preston Parsons. Parsons, you know, he's going to have all the wrestling. He's going to have all the pace. Semmelsberger has taken up a lot of damage. So why not? We'll just take Semmelsberger. Wall does a course, Acosta against a savvy veteran. Um, uh, savvy veteran, whatever. We got a course, a court does Acosta in the first round. Phil Hawes versus Bruno Ferreira. This is obviously going to finish in the first round. And, you know, if, if anything, if Phil Hawes is going to win, except for the first round, it's going to be by decision, going by takedowns. But we're going to play him by submission, plus what is it, 900. Ricky Simone, a perfect stylistic matchup. He's going to he's going to take down Batista. He'll let him get up, take him down again, grind him out. Batista's run against terrible competition will come to an end when he fights somebody good that was just off the main event. And if that happens, we lose because we will be taking Batista by submission. Uh, Jim Miller fixed fight against Gabriel Benitez so that he can make it to U UFC 300. Well, they might invite him to UFC 300 anyway, but if so, maybe it's after a loss. Hopefully that's the case. So we are 0 for 11, apparently, with just Mandomag and Kalaya versus Johnny Walker. So Johnny Walker, uh, they fought like one, you know, two minutes of this fight before and then uh Ankaliyev got him with an illegal knee to uh to end the fight make it a no contest and this is this is the deal Ankaliyev is boring he's you know he's bordering on fraud actually but he's probably going to do enough to beat Johnny Walker um Johnny Walker's one path to victory is going to be just if he gets some flash knockout so these are the things that we can't do OK, we, we can't really play Ankali off late. OK, we can't play him by decision. And unfortunately, we can't play Walker early. OK, because that's his path. So all we can really do is some variation of Ankali of early. And if that's the case, we have to pick a particular round and a method if we're going to get 11 to 1 or the ridiculously atrocious Johnny Walker by decision. So let's just take a look at some of these lines. Let's see if Walker by decision, we can get plus 1100. I doubt it. So let's see. Ooh, Johnny Walker by decision, just leg picking him for five rounds and getting it done. Is that humanly possible? Hmm. What about this one? How about Walker by submission? I mean, correct me if my information is inaccurate, but I think he's gotten a couple of submissions. Let's just take a look. Let's look at the um, Uncle Ayab. Nah, there's just nothing here. Oh, yeah. So if we can get a takedown from Uncle Ayab in one of these rounds and a submission, ooh, we could be in business. So... We could play Ankalaya by submission in round one plus eighteen hundred. I mean, all this talk about how he's boring or whatever it is. I mean, quite frankly, he did take him down in that first in that first fight. Although it was not, you know, it was only because Walker just kind of like walked into the takedown. Oof. Plus eighteen hundred by submission round one, or by submission round two. What about just by submission? Is that what? No, it's only plus 800. That's not good enough. So which one's going to be? Now, we've we've done this before. We have coin flipped this and been on the wrong end of the coin flip. 
many times. Like we wanted one, we picked the other. And unfortunately, we can't play them both. We can't whip out. So what are we going to do? Well, it looks as though as as my as a very, very good content creator, Mr. Lou Betcha once said, uh, plus 2,800 is more than plus 1,800. So we're going to do that one. Ouch. Ankalaev, it by submission in round two. Let the first round be boring. And then he gets him out of the best submission in round two, plus 28 to one to get back all of our losses for the day. And after I log off of Zoom, I can put all this stuff in because uh, my location will be available. Uh, again, now, hopefully the logic and the the, the, the process of talking through all this and, and, and realizing what we're trying to accomplish here was more important than the actual picks. But hey, maybe the picks do well also. Uh, that will do it. Good luck, everybody.